so we start with the, uh, the harder aspect. We've heard a bit uh, of this already. Um, the main point here is that uh, with the advancement of technology, smaller and smaller things can be, can be built. Um, and uh, this was the first transistor, uh, Bell Labs in 1947. Uh, this was the first integrated circuit, uh, Jack Kirby in 1958. We've seen this picture yesterday, I think. Um, and technology has moved on for the past 50 more years. So in 2010, one breakthrough was to go to 25 nanometer uh, processes. And uh, if you look at this picture here, this is a, a, a silicon surface where you can see the individual atom. You can count the atoms of silicon, and that's 10 nanometers. So you can actually count how many there are, about 20 atoms of silicon in 10 nanometers. So in 2010, it was 25 nanometers, so about, about 50 atoms for the width of a transistor. Just this month, the, the 7 nanometer process went into mass scale production. You can, can't yet buy yet, maybe next year, but in full, in full scale production. So 7 nanometer, it's smaller than that. Um, uh, although uh, that's the transistor size, the pitch between transistors is still 55 nanometers, so there's still some, some space to grow there. Um, but basically, we are getting really, really close to the limit. Um, and uh, uh, some people even try to build single molecule transistors. They have demonstrated them. That you cannot do much with them. You cannot connect them to anything, just one molecule. But in principle, you can, you can go all the way down to, to a single molecule. Uh, for comparison, this is a picture of uh, uh, probably 1910, 2010 kind of technology. So all technology, these are VLSI uh, uh, stripes of a conductor on silicon, and the little triangles are DNA triangles, just to give you an idea. DNA is only two nanometers thick. Um, uh, but the, the main point of this picture is that uh, um, we have very, very few more cycles left. So uh, since you start, you keep, uh, uh, you know, 25, 7, you keep dividing the number of uh, every, every cycle you divide by two, so you, it's going to be pretty soon, depending on how you count, but very, very few cycles before you hit the limit where you have transistors made of one molecule, and then you cannot apply Moore's law anymore, for sure, at least the way, the way it has been applied so far. So that, that is the limit. That will stop. Maybe it will grow wider, or who knows, but the, the current uh, uh, the historical growth will terminate right there suddenly. Um, so that's a fact, and uh, there is currently this race to the bottom, so uh, trying to get there as fast as possible and then stop. Um, uh, this slide is, a, so fortunately, there is a new uh, exponential trend in technology, uh, uh, and that is the, has to do with DNA. So look at this uh, you know, semi-log paper again, um, uh, this log scale here. Uh, Moore's law, is, this is based on cost, so, so Moore's law goes down here, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a straight line because it's a logarithmic scale. And this other curve, is the uh, cost of uh, DNA sequencing, genome sequencing. Until 2007, was basically tracking Moore's law, basically the same kind of machines were being developed for miniaturization and so on. And then suddenly there was a dramatic improvement after 2007, and yet now we have an exponential over an exponential. So this is growing much, 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 much faster than, than Moore's law at this point. And this is reading DNA, okay? Uh, writing DNA is not this good. Writing DNA is still pretty much tracking Moore's law. Reading DNA is going way, way faster. But if, even just looking at this picture, if you're a young person, uh, you know, you should think, oh, stop working about computing, you know, start working on biology or something like that. Because this is where the growth is going to be in the next, uh, you know, 50 plus years. And this is really beginning. This is not like Moore's law is close to the end. This is really the beginning of it. Now, here is an example of where technology is going. So there is a device uh, made by Oxford Nanopore, which is, uh, you can buy it currently, it's about this big, and it's a DNA scanner, DNA sequencer, uh, with a USB port. You can just plug into your laptop, you, you drop some D DNA on top of it, and it sequences the DNA on your laptop. And this is the new device they've announced, not yet on sale, and this just plugs into your, into your uh, cell phone, and you can scan your, you know, sequence your DNA right uh, at the restaurant or something. Um, so this is uh, the way technology is going and DNA scanning. And uh, uh, in general, we are trying to build uh, these this very, very small things: uh, transistors, uh, biological devices, and so on. 
And we need to look at nature to get some inspiration of how to do these things, because there are some significant problems. Now, this is a random picture from the internet. I have no idea what's going on there. But uh, imagine that you're trying to build that house, and the only tool you have is that hammer. How do you do it? It's very difficult. It's very difficult to build uh, things which are much smaller than your tools. And uh, we, you know, there are ways, in computing we have lithography, to be able to shrink down masks to a very, very small size from, from much larger size. But that's not the way, for example, nature does it. There is no lithography in nature. And how, the way nature builds the smallest possible things, because they're all molecular-sized things uh, at the bottom level, is by a process called self-assembly. So this is a bacterium. This is the membrane of the bacterium. And bacteria can swim, and swim with flagella. And, and there's a motor that drives the flagellum. And it's mostly made out of proteins. Each, one, each little piece is a protein component. And they self-assemble in that configuration. There, is no, yeah, there are no little engineers there assembling the motor. The motor assembles itself just by sticking into the right configurations. That's the, so this is the rotor. Those are the stators. And this is the flagella that gets built from the inside out gradually, uh, pushing through the membrane, and then keep, keeps growing outside the membrane and building. You see, there's this cap, and the stuff comes from the inside and, and grows at the top. So uh, you could also like, say, my, my cell phone, it's, uh, it's interesting because it's Turing complete, because it can run any application which, it, which has yet to be written. So there is no bound on, on the complexity of what it can do. Uh, and this is the key, because once you have uh, this kind of completeness, although uh, if it's a pure information device, it doesn't maybe mean much, but if you connect it to physical realities, then you can do a lot of interesting stuff. So for example, the Industrial Revolution, uh, one of the things that bootstrapped it was the automation of, of uh, uh, textile production. So you have a loom, and a loom typically can produce only cloth, that's what it does. Uh, and you can design patterns in the cloth, and you can push the right lever to so get the different kind of patterns. But if you now attach a Turing complete uh, device uh, to the loom, you can now program arbitrary patterns. So any conceivable pattern you could possibly imagine that could possibly be built, this machine can now produce automatically. Um, and again, it's complete, but now we can program not just information, we can actually program physical forces. We can program uh, the, 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 the output of this device, physical output, we can, the, we can sense the, 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 um, the tension on the, on the wires and so on. So it now becomes a controller, sensing to actuation and computation in the middle. So this is much more interesting, and of course you can use that for all kinds of kind of manufacturing. And again, it's important because it's complete. You can do whatever pattern you want. Now, this is, that was the last century's technology, so what is new now? What is new now is that we can do the same kind of thing. We can produce arbitrary clothes without the loom. So we can program the, the material that forms the patterns, uh, like this pattern here. We can program the strands of clothes so that they will self-assemble into the pattern that we want. And we can do that without the loom. So, uh, like this guy said, it's like 3D printing without a 3D printer. You, you design the, the, the yarn, the, the, clo the cloth, that knows how to assemble itself in that particular pattern you want, to, you want to do. And again, this is complete. Whatever pattern you may want to produce, you can program it to, to do that. So this is new, this is this century. This is uh, programming matter, not, no longer programming forces of uh, information. Yes. Well, first of all, you can imagine it's deterministic. If it's stochastic, you can have stochastic Turing machines, whatever. You know, there are many computational models that, that work fine with that. Uh, it's, not, it's not a big problem. But let's not... Uh, it, it, will become a, it will become an issue with a, a molecular system that mostly are stochastic, but there are all, all plenty of mathematical models that take that into account. We'll, we'll actually discuss that in the second part quite, quite deeply, so if I have time. Um, so for now, let's assume everything is deterministic for a second, uh, so no, no issue with that. Uh, so now we, we can do these kind of things currently only, so this kind of magical self-assembly of cloth, only with uh, DNA and RNA, because uh, just historically these are the materials for which we have machines uh, that can read and write. So you can imagine other materials like DNA and RNA, which are programmable in the sense of having able to program the sequences, 
but or even if you imagine them, even if maybe some chemist is able to produce them, we do not have good machines to read them and write them, as we, as we have for DNA. And we have them for DNA because of biology, because there's been centuries of developing biology, and biologists cared about those machines and they built them. So it's a kind of a technological accident that the same material which is good for biology is also good for technology, but we tend to use it as a, as a, as a construction material, not really as a biological material. In fact, often you just synthesize it from scratch. It's not even biological origin. It's just made from scratch from individual chemicals, and it has nothing, nothing to do with, with life. Okay? So that said, DNA in itself is, a, is an amazing material. Uh, just to give a brief, brief tutorial. So it's made of uh, base pairs. So this is the, on the left hand side is G, on the right hand side is C, and they kind of interlock. So they, they fit with each other and they stick to each other. And this is the T on the left hand side, A on the right hand side. And also they interlock in a different way so they do not interlock across. So T stick with A, G, G stick with C, and or vice versa. And DNA is uh, simply a sequence of this base pair now seen in profile here in yellow. So a sequence of uh, any combination of these base pairs. And uh, the famous double helix is just a scaffolding that holds these things in place. Okay? It holds the, the base pairs in place. Uh, that was a, uh, these are animations which are not, they're not photographed, they're not real microscopic images, they're just uh, uh, renderings, so they're not uh, completely accurate, but give you an idea of what DNA might look like at the atomic scale. Um, and, uh, uh, the other thing to notice about DNA is that uh, it has an amazing information density. So um, in each human cell, in each one of our cells, there are three billion base pairs. And uh, the DNA in each cell that we have is two meters long. So it's, each cell is two meters. Uh, in terms of information content, each cell is 750 megabytes, so one compact disk, pretty much. Uh, but it gets folded into a little ball, which is a six uh, micron uh, big which means that the information density is an amazing 140 million terabytes per cubic millimeter, uh, which means that you can take all the data on the internet, and at this density, it fits in a shoebox. Okay. So uh, that's pretty, pretty amazing. So the, the move here is the process that DNA goes through to get folded and folded and folded and folded into more and more helical uh, shapes so they actually can fit into this very, very little tiny ball. Um, and it keeps going, doing that recursively at many, many different scales until you get chromosomes. Uh, now, so if you think of what that means in terms of processing, every time a cell duplicates, it actually has to copy two meters of DNA. That is non-trivial, and it has to do that relatively quickly, uh, and it does that concurrently, otherwise there would be no way it could, it could do it in reasonable time. And it also has to do it reliably, or else you get sick. Uh, so it, it's a very non-trivial task, uh, both computationally and mechanically. Uh, and again, thinking about big numbers, uh, the DNA, the amount of DNA in the human body, so we have about 10 trillion cells. So the total amount of DNA in our body is uh, uh, 133 astronomical units long, okay, uh, and 7.8 octabytes. And nobody knows how, many, how much DNA there is on Earth because all the bacteria, you know, who knows. But if you just count the DNA in the human population, uh, you string it all you know, end to end, that is 20 million light years long. And consider that Andromeda is only 2.5 million light years away. So it, it's a lot of DNA. So it's an amazing, amazing kind of uh, thing. Uh, so, not, yeah? May, may I, I, I would like to ask you, okay, this is just fine. Okay, you say that DNA, there are 10 trillion cells in the human body. Mm -hmm. But actually, each cell contains the same DNA, right? Yes. So actually, the, the, the amount of information yeah. is 750 megabytes, not 7.5 octabytes. You're perfectly right. It's, it's always the same copy. Um, but uh, I will talk about later about the DNA storage technology, where you hope to you know, use this kind of property of DNA to, to store a large, large amount of information, which will not be replicated to that, to that extent. So the other thing that DNA can do, not just uh, uh, structurally, but also mechanically, uh, can replicate. Um, so here you can see the process of DNA replicate. And this is, a, again, a, a movie. It's not, it's not reality, but it's done in real time. So this is the speed at which DNA uh, duplicates itself. So you get one strand of, uh, double strand of DNA in and, and two double strands of DNA out. 
And uh, when you replicate DNA, the two strands go in kind of uh, opposite directions, the directionality. So if you want to copy one strand, there's a machine that just uh, walks around it and makes a copy of that strand. But also have to copy the other strands, and the other strand is going in the wrong direction. So what is actually happening here is that uh, this machinery makes a copy of the other strand in the, in the reverse, and then jumps back and patches, and then does another segment, and then jumps back and patches. So it's a, it's a very complicated process because of this uh, double directionality. But in the end, you, you, get, uh, you get two strands out. Oops. OK, one, one, the easy one that comes down from here, and the hard one that comes from, from up there. So this goes to about 50 nucleotides per second uh, speed. In bacteria, it goes faster, about 1,000 nucleotides per second, but they make many more mistakes that we probably do not want to make. Uh, the other thing that can happen with, uh, with DNA is, is the transcription. You translate uh, DNA to RNA, uh, and this is done at a speed of about 50 to 30 oops, base per second. Um, uh, go back. Um, and, uh, and this is to give uh, also an idea that although this is, uh, it looks uh, you know, pretty fast for a kind of molecular machine, in terms of co computer cycles, this is very, very slow. Okay? The, the clock cycle of this kind of technology is extremely low for our current standards. And so this is also to say that we, we have no intention or no hope to use this kind of technology to replace computers or silicon the way we understand them and we have them today. But we hope to use the technology in situations where computers are not that good, and particularly to interface to biological entities. So keep this in mind uh, that it is not we never want to replace computers or silicon this way, but this is going to be good for other reasons. Um, so, um, so now there are many, many uh, possible nanofabrication techniques and materials. Now, nanotechnology is a big area, and there are carbon nanotubes, there are all kinds of things that people are building. Um, uh, and so what is special about DNA? Uh, I will try to explain that uh, uh, only DNA and RNA, and RNA you know, only nucleic acids, uh, currently, at least, are the ones that we can use to do a, a number of tasks, like organizing matter, not just DNA, but also other kinds of matter in specific patterns. Uh, we can use it to execute any kinetics, so with some caveats, uh, but basically any kind of imaginable uh, behavior over time we can, we can emulate. Uh, we can use DNA, and just using DNA, you can assemble nanocontrol devices. I will go through step by step on that. And also, because of its biological origin, we can interface to biological entities like cells. So let's start with uh, organizing uh, matter. Uh, this is uh, a, a called uh, DNA origami, and you will probably see it uh, also a bit later. And uh, the gray strand is a single strand that goes all the way, a zigzag through the whole picture here. And it's, the, uh, it's a single strand that comes from a virus. Uh, so they just harvest a, 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 some a viral DNA, which is about 8,000 bases long. So this is very long. And they take it from a virus because we cannot actually build DNA that long very easily. But then the color strands are synthetic and they're short. And so you take about, so for example, this one here, red and orange, is one little staple strand, it's called. And this is complementary to the gray one here. And it's complementary to the gray one in a different position there. So this little staple tends to bring close these two uh, other pieces of the gray strand. So if you have enough staples, and here you have all the staples, then you can basically shape the long strand in any configuration you want by deciding which pieces to get, make, make close to other pieces. And so you can, for example, make this funny shape, or you can make a rectangle, you can make any, any kind of configuration you want. And uh, after you've done that, uh, so what was the gray strand? It was the, was the genome of, of a virus. So it's full of genes. From, your, from our point of view, it's just a random string because it's whatever the genome of the virus is. But the point is that each subsequence is unique. Uh, it's just some, comb some combination of A, C, and G, which happens to be pretty much unique in the whole strand. So that means that each subsequence is addressable because we know where they are, which means that this, this is now an array of pixels, and we know wh what each pixel, what the sequence is. And so if we can bind something to that sequence, we can locate that whatever to that pixel. So it becomes an addressable array of pixels that we can use to locate, to place uh, things. So if you want to build something else other than DNA, you just need to bind that something else to DNA that binds to the specific location where you want that something else to go, and then you can build configuration of something else which is not DNA, as long as you can bind to DNA. So this is, a, this is an idea which is a and then maybe you throw away the DNA once you've done the, the assembly of the other material. So this uh, says you can use this to bootstrap other, other materials for, for configuration on the molecular scale. 
Now, uh, executing uh, any kinetics. Um, this I will, do, uh, will explain in detail in, a, in the following section. Uh, uh, but basically, we can build gates, uh, some kind of uh, computing gates for out, of, out of DNA uh, uh, single and double strands. And we can use them to do computation. I will describe that uh, more in detail. And in general, we can combine various uh, uh, capabilities of DNA to build all the components that you need uh, to, to build uh, uh, nanocontrol devices. So to build a controller or a nanocontroller, in general, you need uh, some sensing capability to look at the environment. You need uh, some actuation capabilities to modify, you know, to produce external forces. Um, you need uh, to do some computation in between, between sensing and, and, and actuation. And you need some kind of scaffolding to, to hold the whole things together physically. Okay? Uh, and it so happens that each one of these components can, can be done just with DNA and, and nothing, pretty much nothing else. So let's see uh, in detail how that happens. Let's first talk about the scaffolding, how you construct physical structures that can hold other things together. Um, now, this is a picture I've taken at a model, uh, Caltech, a physical model of DNA, and it looks like two strands vertically. But if you look closely, there's something funny going on here. You see, there is a, there is a strand that comes from the top, one of these helical strands, but here it crosses over to the other one and comes, uh, goes up to the top that way. And uh, the one that comes from the bottom, it also crosses over and goes that way. And the same thing happens uh, you know, on the other two strands go, go straight across. And the same thing happens at this other location here. So you have two uh, cr crosses, it's called double crossover DNA. And what this does is it takes these two helices, helices which uh, each one of them is kind of r relatively floppy, and puts them together in a m much more solid configuration. And this is now almost like a little brick of DNA. It's a, it's a solid, straight configuration that tends to be quite, quite rigid. So this is the, uh, the kind of uh, the configuration of that, of that thing. Moreover, you have now at the top, you have four possible attachment points. You, can, you see, you can let uh, one of the strands to hang over, and one stops here, the other one continues. So this, this, uh, this open part here can bind something else in other DNA. So you have four possible attachment points for this, uh, for this uh, little brick. And, and that's how you do those patterns. You can, if, for example, this, the, diagrammatically, that's indicated by these uh, shapes, the different uh, 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 sticking parts that hang out here. So it could be a square, so this would match with that part, and this would match with that part. So if you build a, a brick with this configuration, with this kind of complementarity, then this will just self-assemble into the structure because of the, the way the shapes fit together. So just by making lots of copies of this guy, you put them together, you get a solid uh, surface, uh, and that's how you build this kind of uh, the weave, weave patterns by uh, assembly, the, the right configurations of, of bricks. So that's automatic uh, self-assembly done, done with DNA tiling. Uh, using this idea, people have gone a little bit crazy, and so you can engineer uh, like these little crosses of DNA, again, with sticky bits, instead of just a little linear brick, like a cross with, again, sticky bits on the outside, and then they can uh, stick together and ma make meshes, very, very large meshes of DNA. You can make triangular uh, hexagonal meshes. You can go this uh, kind of uh, uh, very complicated kind of meshes, and all these things basically work. These are actual photographs taken with microscopes of the resulting, resulting DNA. So that technology at that scale works pretty well. And you can even do uh, three-dimensional uh, uh, configurations. So this guy is uh, Ned Seaman, he's the guy who invented all this technology of structural uh, DNA fabrication, it's called. Um, and he was a crystallographer. <coughs> he was trying to crystallize proteins that are kind of floppy, and he couldn't crystallize them because they were too floppy, and he was not going to get tenure. Uh, so he thought that uh, he should find some way to hold these proteins in place so he could take an X-ray uh, of them and do crystallography. So he thought that maybe if, if he had a cage of DNA to hold all the protein in place, then he could uh, do what he wanted to do. And so he developed this technology precisely to hold other stuff in place. And uh, this is kind of hard to see, but these are three orthogonal in, um, uh, rods of DNA in space. So they, they, this is space-filling lattice of DNA. In, in the three orthogonal directions, uh, and they are uh, assembled with, in this configuration, those complementarities. So if you build this little tile uh, and the ends stick together, then you can build this solid three-dimensional array uh, of DNA. 
Uh, and, and then you can maybe hope that something will stick in the middle and get trapped, and then you can, you can take a picture of it. Uh, another simple example is this uh, very simple uh, tetrahedron. So if you, if you design DNA, uh, those are four strands, blue, green, yellow, and black, and they have this kind of complementarity that you design. Uh, then again, you just mix them in water, and automatically you get little uh, tetrahedra that, again, maybe they can contain some, they can trap some material inside. So there, in fact, now even a, uh, a CAD tool called CAD Nano, uh, uh, very much like uh, uh, computer-aided design engineering tools, where you say, I want to build a shape that looks like this or like that, and it will automatically design the DNA sequences that will fold eventually into, into that three-dimensional shape. And these are all things which have actually been built, and this is an, uh, an image of one of them. I think it's, uh, it's this, uh, this one here. Uh, and this is an actual photograph of uh, one of that which has been built. So, so you can actually kind of engineer to some degree this kind of uh, uh, structural materials. Uh, so back to the uh, uh, DNA origami. So this is what really one of the major breakthroughs of the technology. People didn't expect this to work so well, but now it's completely routine. You just order all these uh, uh, DNA staples. You, uh, you, 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 order the, you buy the viral DNA, you just mix them in your lab, and, and it works. And you can decide what kind of shapes to do. There are tools to, do, to assemble different shapes. The, the first one that was published was this uh, uh, shape here, uh, uh, technically called disk with three holes in the, in the publication. Uh, and people have done uh, you know, maps of the US, maps of China, uh, done written on DNA with, the, with the, you know, again, placing, this is placing different molecules in biotin on top of this uh, addressable DNA grid so you can write on it. So, and this is now being used uh, quite routinely, routinely in many places. One of the, reason, one of the good uh, motivations for using it is that since you can place stuff, you can place uh, uh, computational gates onto this. So it becomes like a breadboard for placing computational DNA gates in, in, in a known configuration. And this is one of the things which are kind of hot right now. So, um, so another thing about uh, uh, structure, if you have an information-rich physical structure, that can be used for storage. And DNA is information-rich because you can decide what the sequences spell. Uh, as, as I said, DNA has that kind of density, and now this is seen uh, quite seriously by Microsoft and probably, I guess, IBM as a potential uh, storage medium for data centers, for long-term storage, you know, beyond the tapes, uh, for long, even longer-term storage, uh, because of this uh, amazing information density. So this is such that, for example, this was a, a first uh, tried by uh, Greg, uh, George Church at Harvard, so he said, oh, it would be fun to store something in DNA. So he took a YouTube video, a few, a few kilobytes, and decided to store it into DNA. And the very, very first experiment that, he ever, that has ever been done to store something in DNA, it was here, which was way, way, way higher density than any technology we have ever, we ever had. It's even higher density than any biological system. So, and this was the first try, OK? Um, and now people have made progress. There are, you, know, there are, there are, you have to encode the, the information into short DNA sequence because that's what you can synthesize. So you have to break information into pieces, uh, encode it, uh, make sure it's redundant, make sure you can read it back in the, with, with, the, with error correction. But all that is, is classical you know, uh, algorithmics. Uh, and you can do that. And people are looking very, very, very closely at this technology. It's still very expensive, so if you want to, if you want to store a, a YouTube video, it probably costs you half a million dollars right now. But you know, eventually, it, you know, given these uh, uh, curves, uh, it will get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Um, and uh, so DNA storage is big. Uh, uh, beyond that, uh, uh, one of the problems with DNA storage is that uh, you have to, you, what, if you want to search for information, uh, you do not want to read the whole database back and then search on your computer. You, somehow you want to search the information where it is in the DNA. So you do want some kind of computation that goes on into, in your database inside of it, so you don't have to, to read the whole, to sequence the whole, the whole database to find something. And so this is something, one of the motivations for wanting to do computation, actual computation in DNA, as opposed to doing computation in, uh, in, in silicon. Uh, so another thing that we need for uh, uh, nanocontrollers, I will tell you in a second why we, we want nanocontrollers, is sensing. And sensing is something else we can do 
uh, with DNA. These are called aptamers. So an aptamer is an artificially evolved DNA molecule, uh, and you use them to identify target molecules that you want to study, some, maybe some kind of pollutants in the environment, some poison, something like that. It will be some kind of molecule which has some kind of funny shape, like this one in the middle here. So you start with a, a library of random DNA sequences. You just throw them all at this, uh, at this uh, uh, target molecule, and some of them, by accident, will, will kind of fold around it a little bit and stick to it a little bit. Then the, you, there are ways of selecting those, those things that, that stick a little bit from the soup. Uh, you read them back, you see what sequence they have, and then you artificially mutate the sequence randomly, and now you have a new library, and you throw that new library to the, the same molecule again, and you do this about a, about a dozen times, and pretty soon you will get a, a DNA uh, sequence that pretty much perfectly fits, uh, falls around this particular molecule and, and hopefully no other molecule. And moreover, since it's DNA, it can also have a, 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 a something sticking out that says, oh, I've seen this molecule. Okay? So these are called aptamers. They adapt uh, by artificial evolution to target molecules. And this notion of, uh, and this is sensing, you're sensing something in the environment. And just sensing is incredibly powerful uh, if you use it correctly. Uh, this is an experiment that was done uh, by using two aptamers, one attached to the other, so no computation, just two, two sensors, if you want. And one sensor uh, detects, det sorry, detects the, uh, uh, the whatever thing you want to detect, like a pathogen, in this case anthrax, uh, and the other aptamer detects uh, a, a, a molecule that the, our native immune system hates. So when our native immune system sees this molecule, alpha gal equidope, it just eats it. There are, there are cells that, whose job is to eat this molecule. Uh, so if you, if you link uh, by two ap ap aptamers this uh, you know, no, known bad molecule to something else, that something else also becomes a known bad molecule, in a sense. So you're, you're telling the immune system, this molecule is just as bad as that one, and when the immune system sees this molecule, it will lead this one and also that one at the same time. So it will get rid of anthrax. And so this was done in, uh, in mice. Uh, mm -hmm. So here is mice uh, uh, poisoned so poison with anthrax plus the, this aptamer and 100% survival. And here are the uh, glorious mice that poisoned with anthrax but not the aptamer and not so good. Okay. So, so just the uh, idea of uh, being able to recognize something in the environment, even sometimes without computation, is, is actually quite powerful. Um, another uh, hot topic in, in sensing is transcriptional sensors. So here is uh, genetic engineering where you introduce uh, artificial genes in some cell that uh, can uh, be activated by, by known molecules in the environment. And so this way you, use, uh, you basically trigger some genetic program uh, by this artificial gene that you know can detect certain specific molecules and cause something to happen. So this is more in the, in the uh, kind of synthetic biology world. And you try to use, uh, uh, one thing that we're doing in my lab, we're trying to use this idea to build uh, uh, artificial patterns uh, out of uh, a gene system that detect uh, uh, certain molecules and uh, produce another molecule that the other system will detect, and that will produce another molecule that the first system will detect, and so it kind of they go back and forth and they form a kind of interaction patterns within themselves. Okay, so um, actuation. So this is also quite interesting. The first actuator that was built is this thing called a DNA tweezer. Uh, it's, uh, it's this configuration of uh, uh, DNA. And, uh, and then there is this uh, single strand that is complementary to this one here, so it will bind there. And it's also complementary to that one there. And just by this complementarity, it's forcing these two pieces to come together. Okay? So this is operating like a force that is causing those two pieces to come together. And then another strand you can add that is complementary there, and so now this will displace the strand that was added before, and it will now allow the things to open up again. So under, just by adding these strands of DNA, you can cause these uh, tweezers to open and close uh, reliably. And uh, people also have done, so a tweezer just doing that, but if you make multiple tweezers, one attached to the other, you get a spring, okay? So you can actually get a spring. Uh, and people have done those experiments very well. So this is a way to produce forces just from information. You just add these, these strands and, and, uh, and they cause something to, to move. Uh, another way of uh, 
causing things to move, there's this thing called DNA walker, so which are pretty, I'm not going to explain the details, but this is a, a DNA strand, which is your, the thing you walk over. It has some attachment points, some steps, and there is a walker, which is a bipedal uh, DNA gadget that alternatively steps through, the, uh, to, to, through this uh, uh, post, and is, the, is arranged in such a way that it will move in one direction as opposed to or maybe, or maybe to even randomly back and forth, but there are ways of going in one direction. So this is actually, uh, you, can, you, can, you can move uh, uh, this uh, bipedal walker along the, along the strand. This is uh, inspired by biological mechanisms that do the same, not with DNA, but with proteins. And one of the ideas here is to use this to do a micro-scale assembly, assembly uh, plants. So you can imagine that this uh, walker is carrying some, some, uh, some, some load, something that you want to transport to someplace else, and you want, when you get there, you want to react to something else another walker brings, and then you can build, build these very, very detailed assembly lines for, for manufacturing at the, at the molecular scale. Um, you can also build motors out of DNA. Now, this is not DNA. This is uh, uh, the way uh, it is done with proteins, by a specific uh, bug, uh, a bacteria called uh, Rickettsia, which gives you spotted fever. Uh, this bacteria in invades cells. So this is a cell here. You know, uh, eukaryotic cells are very much, much bigger than bacteria. So this invades the, the cell. And then it, it doesn't have a flagellum like the, the, the thing we saw at the beginning. Uh, it wants to move around in the cell. And what it does, it uses the, uh, the cell's own acting fibers, which kind of swim around, and it polymerizes them behind it and basically makes a jet stream of, of uh, acting that pushes it forward. So it's propelling itself over the own, on the cell's own uh, uh, polymers. Uh, and this, uh, this kind of uh, uh, runaway polymerization process we can uh, replicate with the DNA. It's called hybridization chain reaction. This is another, another of the key, key technologies. Uh, so imagine we start with uh, uh, two, uh, these are called hairpins of DNA. Uh, so these two are complementary. This is just uh, uh, the band to go from here to there. And there's something sticking there. So green is complementary to green and yellow is complementary to yellow, but, but green is hidden inside this band, so green cannot actually uh, stick to that. Okay? So in this configuration, nothing happens, uh, because there is nothing, there's no open complementarity. But you can add maybe just a single molecule, so you have lots and lots of those, you know, lots and lots of copies of these guys. You can add ju maybe just one single molecule of initiator, which is, looks like this. Now this will be complementary to there, so it can stick to that part. And, uh, and when it sticks to that part, it begins to invade this uh, double sequence and, and open it up, this place, so that this will flip up. Okay, this one it will insert itself there, and this will flip up, and you get into this configuration. So that's the first step. Now what do we have? Now we have uh, a green, which is open, and here we have a green, which can bind to it. So now this guy can bind to that, and this will open it up and flip that one open, and so we go like that. And now we have a yellow, which is open, so another one of those now can fit there. And so, it's, you see, with a single seed, we're now building a potentially unbounded uh, polymer that keeps growing and growing and growing. And that is almost like a little uh, DNA explosion. It, uh, it, it basically, you, you very quickly build uh, uh, something that is going to push stuff away. It, it's, uh, it's, a, it's in a sense a motor. Uh, okay, so we've seen all that we can build all these components, uh, sensing, actuation, uh, constructing, computing I will do later. Uh, and just to finish off with this section, uh, let's see how we can use that to, to build medical devices, so, or sometimes call them computational drugs. So this is something which has been done in vitro. It doesn't, doesn't work in cells for many, many reasons, but in, you know, it will have to be engineered properly to work in cells, but in test to work, works perfectly well. And the idea is the following. Suppose you have, uh, so there are, there are known indicators of disease like cancer, uh, which are, these indicators are uh, small molecules or proteins that are present in cancer cells but are not present in, in healthy cells. But it's all probabilistic. You know, if you see one of these indicators, it's an indicator, you say, well, there's some probability that this cell has cancer if it has this indicator. But if you see four of them in the same cell, then you're pretty sure that the cell is not, is not quite healthy. So you can build a device that uh, wants to detect in a single cell if all four of those indicators are present or not. So one simple way to do that is this, again, with a hairpin of DNA. And it's not just uh, the hairpin, there are also uh, a bunch of enzymes 
that recognize the indicators, and, uh, like, uh, and once, they, once they recognize the indicator, uh, they, they cut a corresponding piece of DNA. They are designed that way. So the first, uh, the first enzyme recognizes the indicator number one and casts the first section of the DNA, and they end up with this. The second enzyme recognizes the second indicator and casts the second section, and so on, until the fourth one casts the last piece, and this causes the air pin to be released, this, this sequence here. Now, this one, it happens to be a sequence of only 12 nucleotides, which is a, which is a FDA-approved drug called Vitravine, and it's just a DNA sequence. So why is that a drug? Because this sequence is a signal for the cell to commit suicide. But when the cell sees the sequence, it says, oh, game over. So um, basically, it says, if you see all four of these indicators in the same cell, then uh, ask that cell, please commit suicide. Okay. Uh, now, this is uh, the simple version. Uh, what they had to do, actually, in reality, is to make sure that there were no false positives and no accidental matches. So actually, they had a parallel track of uh, computation that were trying to make sure that the right things were happening. So you can imagine this to become much more complicated with lots of checks and balances and make sure that nothing wrong happens to good cells. So you can imagine these things could be quite sophisticated, so you actually want some real computational power to detect these conditions uh, in, in, and not just a, a simple AND gate. Uh, and uh, so to sum it all together, this is a picture from a friend of mine, actually the guy who got me to uh, this kind of field, uh, Udi Shapiro. Uh, he says that uh, you know, in the future we will still have doctors, but instead of having one doctor for each 100 or 200 people, we're going to have one doctor in each cell. So in each cell there is a little thing, a little kind of semi-intelligent thing that does local diagnosis for that cell. And if the cell is healthy, pass. If the cell is sick, then we'll deliver a drug to that cell or maybe kill that cell. And this, this doctor is a, is a nanocontroller that you have to insert in the cell, look at the local conditions. And this way, you're sure there are no side effects. So a side effect is when a drug goes where it's not supposed to go. And so you want to make sure that uh, only the cells which are supposed to get cured are cured, and that you can only do locally by looking at each cell individually. Uh, OK. <clears throat> so um, what time is it? Okay, good. Um, okay, let's talk now about uh, the uh, biological aspect of uh, molecular programming. Uh, in many ways, you can say that biological systems are already molecularly programmed. There are, there are genes and there are uh, little tiny machines that do things uh, in kind of algorithmic ways. Um, and if you look at, if you open a, a textbook in biology, uh, the first page pretty much it tells you that in the cell there are uh, four different kinds of basic components, which are called uh, macromolecules, as opposed to water and the small nutrients. There are four kinds of macromolecules, which are nucleotides, amino acids, phospholipids, and sugars. And it turns out that each one of these four uh, components uh, has the capability to form polymers, and so they have information content. So the, uh, the nucleotides, uh, they, they make DNA, strings of DNA, we've seen that. Amino acids, there are 21, 20, 21, and they, they make proteins okay, by, by specific sequences of amino acids uh, in, in polymers. Um, phospholipids, they form membranes by the self-assembly process, which I described here. These are now two-dimensional two -dimensional things. And sugars, uh, they make uh, uh, recursive trees that end up at the surface of the cell to protect or detect various, uh, various things that happen there. So all these things are programmable. They are information-rich uh, uh, machines, devices, components that can be, self can be assembled into functional units that do something uh, clever based on, the, on, the, on, the, on their programming. Um, and uh, this is my kind of uh, uh, abstract picture of how a cell kind of works. So the, the nucleotides uh, end up forming genes. The genes do regulation. Uh, the me membranes... Uh, uh, do confinement, and actually they're active membranes that keep merging and splitting, so it's not just, not, just not static membranes. And they can do transport of bulk, uh, bulk material. Uh, I mean, uh, mach uh, proteins do lots and lots of things, uh, metabolism propulsion, signaling, transport, and so on. And uh, all these things are interrelated by, within cells, so it's a whole big uh, complicated machine made, of, made out of uh, other submachines. But what is very striking to me is that uh, these three components, each one of them is Turing complete. So, so nature has invented Turing completeness not once, but three times in the same 
in the same cell. And this does not appear to be Turing complete, but it's still recursive trees. It's still you know, quite interesting stuff. So, so there is a lot of programming that, not just in the genome, uh, that goes on into, into this kind of, into this kind of uh, architecture. And uh, <clears throat> to the extent that uh, uh, you can imagine there are programming languages to program these uh, algorithmic machines, uh, Turing complete uh, subcomponents, and biologists themselves have designed, you don't call them programming languages, but they've designed the equivalent of programming languages for these different components. So for the, and they use, usually use diagrams for these programming languages. So gene networks are a way of describing the programming of, of genes, and they use that quite extensively in the literature. For, you probably have not seen this uh, quite uh, so often, uh, these are pr called protein interaction networks that describe how protein, proteins interact with each other. And for example, this means that uh, uh, when A meets B, they form a complex, they stick to each other, and you can call the result X. And then this X complex uh, meets C, and, and they, again, stick to each other, the result you can call Y, and so on and so forth. So there's a little combinatorial language of protein interactions as well. And, and even for membranes, you will find lots of diagrams in, uh, in textbooks of how membranes evolve over time, and that's also, in a sense, a, a, an algorithmic description of what happens to, to the membrane subsystem. So, so there, are, there is programmability in biology, there are programming languages in biology, but um, it, it, by and large, these are programs that we cannot use. They're, they're systems we cannot program ourselves uh, because we do not know enough about them. For example, uh, proteins, we do not know how to predict pretty much their structure by and large, so we cannot uh, design them, engineer them the, the way we want. So it, it, it is not feasible for us at the moment yet to program to program, you know, work in progress, but we're not, we're not there yet. So, so we, what we want to have is some molecular programming language that we can execute, not just biology, not just uh, nature. Um, and maybe execute it even more easily than what nature actually provides for itself. Now, increasingly, uh, there's kind of a consensus. The people have tried many things to, this, to, to invent these programming languages and, and, and computational systems. There's kind of a consensus forming around the idea of, uh, of just using chemical reaction networks as our you know, basic programming language. It is not the, 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 the most expressive, the, the best one, but it's very simple, it's very easy to understand, it's very easy to explain, I can explain it to you, uh, no problem. So uh, chemical reactions, probably seen high school, they look like this. It's an instruction you can think of uh, A plus B goes C plus D. And A, B, and C, and D, typically in chemistry and biology would be specific concrete molecules. Here you look at them as kind of abstract entities, A, B, C, and D. Uh, you can imagine writing algorithms without knowing what A, B, C, and D actually are. So this is very much not chemistry, okay? But you, you can think of them as abstract entities uh, that you can hopefully, and I will describe how you can actually engineer these molecules so that they work this way. Uh, so if you imagine having chemistry as your programming language, what, what is the meaning of uh, these programs? Well, that's given by differential equations that you can derive uh, 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 basically systematically from the, from the chemical reaction networks, uh, and then they will tell you what the, what the system will do over time. It's, there's a lot of, lot of history with that. And there are lots of rich analytical techniques based on calculus to, to, to analyze uh, these chemical reaction networks and understand deeply what, what they do or do not do. So just to give you a very, very simple example of uh, how to program with this kind of chemical programming language, uh, I will, so these are programming examples, uh, not, not real chemistry, but imagine you want to compute the minimum of two things. So what, is the, what are these things? So X1 and X2 will be two species, a species is a, is, a, is a kind of molecule which comes in some kind of large quantity of large copy numbers. So you may be 2,000 of X1, 5,000 of X2, okay? And those are species. And suppose you want to have a computation. So at the end of the computation, you have another species Y whose, uh, whose count is the minimum of X1 and X2. Okay? So can, this is a specification. How do we implement this specification in the chemical and chemistry programming language? Well, you can do that with single instruction x1 plus x2 goes to y. Why? Because, well, either x1, x1 will run out first, and then you have that amount of y, or x2 will run out first, and then you have that amount of y. And so y is going to be the minimum of x1 and x2. Okay? So, so minimum is easy. Now, maximum is not so easy, because uh, there is no, as far as I know, a single structure that can do that. So here we can use this uh, property of maximum. The maximum of x1 and x2 is the x1 plus x2 minus the minimum of x1 and x2. Okay. And now what do we do? Well, um, 
We need to do an addition, a subtraction, and a minimum. Oh, we know how to do that. So first we need, however, so let's start with the, um, with the addition. Uh, so we're going to, uh, this one here, we're going to copy x1 into y and x2 into y. So we get as much y as there is as the sum of x1 and x2. But we also need to reuse the x2 here, so we need to make a copy of x1 and x2 so we don't lose them. So we copy also at the same time x1 into l1 and x2, in, x2 into l2. Okay, so now we have the original x1 and x2 into these new registers, and we have y, which is the sum of x1 and x2. Uh, now we need to um, uh, do the minimum, that we do by that instruction, and put that into k. Uh, and now we do the subtraction, so we happen to know that there is more y than, than k, so we can just do that and send, so kill, kill as much y as there is k, and so that's the subtraction. Now, so this is a program, it's non-trivial, not completely trivial, that presumably, possibly, implements the maximum. Uh, now, this computation is not, sequ it's not like really sequential, like you first do the addition and then the subtraction, it happens all together. Okay, these molecules, these reactions fire as, as long as they're molecules, so it's all concurrent. So I'm, I'm claiming this is doing maximum. It's actually not totally trivial that it's actually doing the right thing, but in, 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 it happens to do that. So uh, as an example of a, you know, non, a slightly, very slightly non-trivial programming in this chemical language. Is that reasonably clear? Um, so you can imagine that we can write uh, much, much more complicated programs uh, and then we will need some way, some way to run them. So how do we run? Suppose we, we want to write these programs and run them. How do we run them? Now, chemistry is not easily executable. Uh, I, can, I cannot go to a chemist and tell him, oh, I have this program here, can you please uh, you know, run it for me? And he will say, well, where, do, where the hell do I go find these uh, molecules in nature that have these exact properties that, do the, that react in exact this way? There, no, there is no reason why they should exist. Uh, because I made up these reactions, not knowing what the x1 or x2 might be. Um, they have no connection to nature or, or, or chemistry. And so the chemists say, you know, I don't know where to find them. So what do we do? Well, um, it turns out that with DNA, you can do it. Um, and this is what I'm going to explain next. So uh, uh, again, before we go, get into that, uh, you may have heard that there is a field called DNA computing that has existed for quite a long time, since the 80s, I think. Um, and originally, it had some goals, which are not the current goals that we have. So let me make some disclaimers. Uh, the first experiment in DNA computing was to try to solve an NP-complete problem, which we all know is pretty much hopeless. Um, uh, but they are hoping that with the huge amount of parallelism that comes from chemical computation, you have, you have trillions of molecules, you might do something that maybe you, can, you, can, you cannot do on a, on a laptop. Well, it turns out that's not true. Uh, in order to, to beat a laptop uh, with DNA, you need the, to solve this kind of even MP complete problems. You would need such a huge amount of DNA, you know, swimming pools whole of DNA, to just be at that kind of level of performance. So this, this is a dead end. People understand that we are no longer trying to solve these kind of problems. So we do not want to solve NP-complete problems. We do not want to repl re replace silicon. What we want to do is to bootstrap a different kind of technology instead of being silicon-based. It's a carbon-based technology that can be used where, where carbon works better than silicon, and typically in, in living things. Uh, and in this, in, this, uh, in this area, DNA is our chosen engineering material. Uh, we know how to write it, to read it. We know how to manipulate it. Uh, the biological origin is accidental, um, but it's an information-bearing material, programmable, and it has lots of wonderful properties. And other materials may be developed in the future, uh, different kind of polymer, you know, information-rich polymers. People are, there are lots of people working on modifying DNA, make it using non-natural base pairing, for example, uh, or different kinds of uh, configuration. People are trying to build completely artificial uh, information-rich polymers. But again, that's very difficult because we do not the machines, both biological and, 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 and electronic, physical, to, to manipulate the kind of materials. Um, so for now, we stick with DNA, but we want to compute and program. Uh, so we do the following. This is a, uh, a DNA sequence, CTGGA, so some, some, some sequence of the four letters. Now we're going to split this into what we call domains, X, Y, and Z. And a domain is just a subsequent, but with the property that if I, if I call one x, one y, and one z, I'm going to assume that x, y, and z are not complementary, so they do not stick to each other. 
And also, they are not complementary to their opposite, to their reverse, to their subsequences. So they are sufficiently orthogonal, they are basically you know, independent of each other. So that is, this is the assumption. And there are ways, there are algorithms to design domains and to design subsequences that have this property to a good extent. So we can assume that if, say, x, y, and z, x, and z are independent orthogonal, uh, uh, so subsequently we call them domains. Um, now we're going to use for computation two different kinds of uh, domains, the short ones and the long ones. Now, the short ones have the property that they're short enough that in typical uh, temperatures and, and conditions, um, they, yeah, if they're complementary, and this means they're complementary, so T will be the domain and, uh, and with an arrow, in, because said they're oriented, so this is no direction. The complementary will be oriented the opposite direction, and T is actually, uh, if I draw it like that, it's not the same domain as the, the complementary, so it should say like T star or something, that's a complementary sequence. But if they're short enough and they're complementary, then they will stick to each other, and I'm going to draw it like this. Uh, but since uh, they're very short and we are at some kind of thermal noise, then uh, the thermal noise is enough to break them apart again. So this will be a reversible uh, operation, hybridization, dehybridization. So this is the uh, short ones. The long ones, instead, are long enough that once they are complementary and they hybridize, they, they stick to each other, then thermal noise is not sufficient to break them apart again. And this means, uh, in practice, means this is about six bases. They break, they break apart automatically. And this is about 15, 20 bases, and they, 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 stay, they stay together. Um, now, we're going, so we have one, one reversible operation and one irreversible operation. We're going to use them in, in, together to do something interesting. Uh, now, the basic uh, uh, process that we're going to use is something called strand displacement, and it works as follows, so a little short movie. Basically, if you have a, a, a sequence sticking out, which we call a toehold, uh, you can use that as a way to invade an existing sequence. So the red one is the toehold. So this single strand DNA can attach to the toehold and then start invading the existing strand, and th the sequence here is the same as the sequence there, so it's just uh, replacing one to one. Uh, and this process is stochastic, it goes back and forth randomly, so it's a random walk, but, and this move is not accurate because it will go back and forth much more than this, uh, but eventually it will get to the end, and when it gets to the end, it, the original strand detaches, and the new strand uh, stays attached because it, it has uh, covered the toehold, so the other one cannot go back and replace it again. So let me show you again diagrammatically. So we have a, a double strand, um, which has a two holes sticking out, and a single strand, which is going to invade it. Uh, so first, the two holes bind, and this is reversible, so they can unbind right away. They do that many times. Um, but then this X and that X are the same, so this can be replaced, the, those bases one by one. So suppose it goes like that. Again, it can go back, uh, stochastic. Uh, when it gets to the end, eventually, then it will displace the original strand. And now, this one does not have the two holes anymore, so it basically cannot go back. And now this is the, the very last step is irreversible. All the rest is, is reversible. Um, now, in this case, uh, I said these two strands match perfectly. Suppose they do not match. Uh, suppose they start, uh, they are equal up to here, and then they are different in this domain. So this will bind there and possibly unbind, and then maybe move forward. But when it gets here, it gets stuck. Uh, suppose the first, the first nucleotide here is actually different. So it gets stuck right here, it cannot go forward. But since it's a random process, if it cannot go forward, it will go backward and eventually detach again like that. So this is good news, because it means if, if you have a good match, if you have a, a good recognition, then something irreversible will happen. And if something does not match, it will just reverse as if nothing had happened. So it's a very good property. So given that, we can now build actual computational devices out of this uh, system. And as, uh, there are many ways to do this. I'll explain a specific, specific one called two-domain architecture. Uh, comes from the fact that the signals, these are going to be our signals, have two domains. The to hold and the X, which means this is the signal called X, whatever that means. Uh, so the signals, they all have this structure uniformly, completely uniform compositional uh, technology. And the gates, they all look kind of like this. There are, uh, there's a bottom single strand, and there are pieces of a double strand on top, interrupted by two holes uh, that act as kind of chain mechanism. So let me show you uh, how to do a very simple computation, which is to transduce a signal X to a signal Y, where Y is completely unrelated to X, no, no commonality, no, no relationship. 
Uh, so this is going to take, take a little bit. Uh, this is the, our gate. The whole thing here is, is the gate we're going to need to transduce x to y. So the input is tx, and the output we want to get is ty. So we start with uh, um, oh, so how to build this gate by self-assembly. We've seen that, okay. Uh, so we start by binding the, uh, the toehold uh, to the there, because there is a complementary x right after that. Uh, so this will start displacing uh, that str top strand, which is also x. And when it gets there, it, this time we just hang by a toehold, so it will detach. Uh, and now it opens up a new toehold for this uh, strand here, which was kind of in a sense there, ready to, to take its place. Um, and, and it binds, can bind to that toehold, and it's complementary with this a here. And so this also will push out that other strand, a t. And at this point, we pause for a second, because you already transduce the original x t to uh, the original t x to a t. And it is a transduction, but in this case, the toehold is on the wrong side. So if we want to chain this kind of gate, we want the toehold to be on the same side as originally. So the second half is to put the toehold in, right, in the right orientation. Uh, and this is using this part of the gate. So now this output, AT, uh, can go here, because there is an AT waiting for it. Uh, so this bind there and displaces this uh, TA uh, strand. And now opens up a new toehold for this YT. Uh, that uh, can bind there and release the, our true output, ty. So now we got, we got the output we wanted. We're not finished that because <clears throat> all we've done so far is reversible. This will go back and forth many times and possibly even to the beginning. So we have not made any irreversible step yet, but we're going to do it now. The second thing we need to do is to get rid of garbage. So we produce uh, uh, these strands here and that strand there. And uh, they do not actually hurt you very much. But if they accumulate uh, enough, they will tend to push your, the, react, the reaction in the wrong direction. They will also break it, but we slow it down. So we want to get rid of them, garbage collectors, so your reaction will not uh, incrementally slow down. So we're going to do the two things at once, garbage collect this garbage, and also lock down the gate irreversibly at the same time. So here is uh, uh, this, guy, this piece of garbage can go here now, and this was specially made for that. Uh, this X segment, so it will stick there, and we'll release this uh, uh, <coughs> X uh, segment, which does not have a toehold, so we assume it doesn't mess with anything, it, it cannot bind to anything else. And similarly, this uh, TA can uh, insert itself there and release that, which has no toehold. And these two operations are irreversible, because these have no, no toeholds so that cannot go back. And these gates are now completely double-stranded, there are no open toeholds, so everything is dead, except for the output that, that we got. So, okay, so we got, uh, uh, we got the transducer from X to Y. Let me see. Oh, what is the energy source? The energy source is the fact that we're actually using up a gate. So every time we do an operation, we consume a gate. But that is, the, that is also the energy source. There is no other energy source. There is no thermal cycling. There is no uh, heat. There is no nothing. There is no electricity. So just the presence of the gate and the... the the configuration of the whole and thermodynamics, because you end up in a configuration which has a, a better energy, energy state, the original state. So the, the reaction will be driven in this direction, and you are going to use that. So you need to have enough gates to keep the reactions going. But again, in this in this uh, in this kind of uh, device, there are no proteins, there are no enzymes, there is no heat cycling. It's all autonomous, automatic, just DNA and salt and water. Anything goes. Now, this is just a little movie of the same thing, trying to show a little bit of the implicit concurrency. So if we get uh, the TA, oops, I think the TA started, so TA, TX arrives, and then another little bit of concurrency going on, you see, um, and then you get a TY out, so you have to watch out for that. And this other, uh, so that is the simple transducer, but on that idea, you can now build uh, arbitrary chemical reactions with many inputs and many outputs. And the way you do that, so suppose you want to do x plus y goes to z, it's more like a chemical reaction, then you just, on the first strand, you just chain the two inputs, x and y, that again produce an intermediary that goes to the other gate and releases the final output. And if you want to have multiple outputs, you just chain them on this strand, so they get all released uh, until there is a final lockdown of the gate. So it's a completely uniform uh, scheme that for any number of inputs, any number of outputs, you can design the... Uh, the strands that will do that. You have to be a little bit careful with garbage collection, get increasingly more complicated the more inputs and outputs you have, but it can, it can be done just as well. And also here there is some 
animation of the concurrency. So X and Y arrive, the strand goes to the other half, uh, the output gets released, and there's some garbage collection. So, so, this is, uh, so why is this interesting again? Usually because it means that for any chemical reaction network whatsoever, in full generality, any number of inputs, output, even zero inputs, zero outputs, whatever, any number of reactions is finite, uh, we can engineer DNA molecules by this scheme that will execute that chemical reaction network. And uh, there is a little issue of, of kinetics, so the, the chemical reaction network will tell you there's, there's a rate of the reaction and there is a, a kinetic law, and DNA does not uh, exactly obey the same kinetic law because this is a multi-step process as opposed to a single-step process. But in fact, people have shown that you can approximate uh, to any degree of precision you want the actual, uh, the original kinetics of the chemical reaction network with this system if you engineer the, the to whole binding strength properly. So we can at, at least, at least uh, approximate to any degree of precision the original chemical reaction network with this uh, kind of uh, scheme. Uh, the other thing which is interesting to notice about uh, this uh, particular technology, so as I said, there are many ways to do this kind of trick. There are many gate architectures that people have devised before this one. Most of them have uh, strange uh, DNA uh, configuration that stick out of the double strand, so they are very non-natural configuration. What is unique to this one that I explained is that it's really just double strands. So the fact that it's double strands, it means we can actually manufacture them by biological means. Uh, the, the, the issue with that is that if you want to make very complicated gates with many inputs and outputs, you're going to need very long uh, DNA strands. You have a 20 plus 20 plus 20 plus 20 plus 20 plus 6 plus 6 plus 6 plus 6. Pretty much you get to 200. When you get to 200, that's pretty much the limit you can synthesize DNA without going to lots of trouble. Um, and, uh, and so you are limited to the complexity of the gates in, the, in that way. But if you actually can get bacteria to make the DNA for you, bacteria are very, very happy to you know, copy thousands and thousands of uh, bases with absolute fidelity, no problem whatsoever. So biology is, is a lot better than the machines we have. Um, and so it's important that we can build these gates biologically, and the way this works is the following, uh, by cloning. So you, um, you prepare your double strand, which is going to become the gate eventually, and, uh, and you put in the plasmid, which is something, a secure piece of DNA that you can inject into a cell, um, and you get the, the cell to replicate your, your DNA many, many, many times. Now, this thing that you prepare at the beginning, this is synthetic, so it can, it can contain errors from the synth synthesis process. But some of them will be correct, the, the way it's a stochastic process, so some of them will be correct, some of them will have errors. Uh, cloning means that you get a, a whole population of cells from a single cell, which means that all the cells in the population have the identical, same identical DNA. So you get multiple clones. Uh, each one is a population of identical DNA, but each one can come from a different individual uh, synthetic gate. So some of those clones will, be, will have errors, but other clones will be all correct. Now you look at each clone, and you see sequences, and you see which ones are correct and which ones have errors, and you just keep the ones which are correct, and then you just keep cloning them. Then they're, you know, they're fine. They, they will just be accurate. So you just remove the errors from the original synthetic uh, strands. You s select them biologically, and then you get bacteria to do the replication for you. You can get very large quantities of very long, very perfect DNA. So that's uh, one of the reasons for why the double, the two-domain technology is quite interesting in this sense. So here are examples of... Uh, uh, <clears throat> so we need to, to think about scaling up. So we want this technology to take off. We need to think of... Uh, uh, kind of following some kind of Moore's law, Moore, Moore's law curve. And, uh, well, so there are good news and bad news. This, these are kind of the most complicated circuits we've been built so far. Um, this is a, uh, this one here, this is a several hundred uh, DNA uh, little gates uh, in a single test tube. Uh, it comes from, a, it's, a, it's a circuit that uh, logically computes the square root of a four-bit number. Uh, once you code it up into DNA, you get a lot more components, uh, so you end up with a few hundred components. Uh, uh, but this actually computes the square root of four bit number, so it's, 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 a, it's a basic gate. Uh, and this is a, um, a neural network made of four neurons uh, implemented in DNA that does a simple classification task in the test tube. You give it uh, some pattern as input, as, as chemicals, and it will classify that, that pattern in, in the output. So, um, 
Uh, and this we can, and uh, Eric Winfrey has a kind of a Moore's law kind of a curve at Caltech. He keeps to see how fast the technology is growing. And so it's growing, it's growing. It's growing. Now, now there are going to be limits because of the notion of uh, uh, operating these things in solution. Once you get into the hundreds and hundreds of components, eventually they start interfering with each other because they're just floating in water and, and bumping into each other. So it's difficult to keep them completely separate, and there is a limit there. And because of that, uh, one of the kind of hot topics these days is to locate uh, these uh, gates, like real electronic gates, on a, on, a, on a board so that there will only be local interactions and there will not be this uh, accidental interference between, between gates that are not supposed to be talking to each other. So here we see again the notion of, uh, of the, of the uh, uh, origami using as a breadboard for, a, uh, for a computational gates, and we hope that this will help uh, scale up the technology even further. Okay, so I think probably this is time to take some questions. And uh, this was a you know, quick summary of the technology, and I will uh, do, do some more detailed topics in the second half. <clears throat> okay, good morning. Um, Nice presentation. Uh, it's very nice to see that biology somehow or nature somehow is really implicated with technology. So we are just mimicking nature, basically. But my question would be, in terms of technical uh, way, do you think that this type of computation would be available to the regular user or if it just be applied in certain fields of biotechnology, let's say? And on the other end, in terms of ethical way as well, how would be the ethical implicities of using the DNA as, a, as it is the molecule of life where every, everything is coded? Uh, what would be the, the implications of using DNA to yeah. our uh, bell pleasure, let, let's say? Uh, so I didn't get the first question. What is... Uh... I, it's in terms of tech, if you think that, for example, we can use this type of computation to do regular tasks, like for example, right. or no. if it's just to be applied in certain fields of biotechnology. No, as I was trying to explain, we have no hope or desire to apply this technology to replace any kind of uh, normal computation that you do day to day. The only thing is this notion of DNA storage that is getting close to real computers, and, and we do computation in the, in the, in the, in the soup, uh, to not be able to read back. So in that sense, it's gonna be probably the closest, but we do not want to replace any kind of existing technology that just, it's, it's really to do new things, to do new things that are not possible today because silicon, you cannot inject silicon into a cell, it will not survive. So you cannot put a microchip in a cell as a microcontroller, you need to put something more biological. Now for the, uh, for the yeah, there are tons of ethical implications, but uh, yeah, the, the simple answer is that uh, uh, synthetic DNA is not life, it's chemicals. So, uh, and, and if you do experiments in test tubes, it's not in, in contact with any kind of life form, so it's completely just chemistry. Now, of course, uh, we hope eventually to inject this into organisms, so then you can get into uh, tricky questions. Um, and, uh, and for example, just to mention, you may know that uh, the sequences of uh, uh, pretty nasty pathogens are public, including the influenza virus of uh, uh, the First World War, um, it, it, they're public and they've been tested and they work. Uh, okay. uh, so now they're not easy to deploy, they're not easy to build yet. They will get easier to build. They're not easy to deploy, uh, and that probably is going to stay true. Uh, but clearly you need some kind of uh, control for that. And that, uh, I mean, it's, not, it's, not, uh, it's, nothing, it's nothing really new. Uh, you know, any technology has this kind of, kind of dual use, uh, and you have to be careful. So um, there are controls in place already. For example, if you go to one of these uh, DNA synthesis companies and you try to order something which happens to be a piece of the influenza virus, uh, you will not get your DNA, you'll get the FBI at your door. So, uh, <laughs> so there, are, there are some you know, checks and they will have to become more extensive as time goes on. At the moment, there is no big danger because the knowledge is not that advanced, but definitely it will get uh, more tricky, the already people are selling uh, labs in a suitcase. You know, you can, have a, you can buy a bento box, it's called, that has a sequencer and uh, some, some, some chemical equipment you can do in you know, your, your lab in the box. I will mention later some examples of things you can do in your kitchen uh, that are quite interesting. Uh, so it, it, will, it will get interesting, but we hope to keep it under control. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, thank you. Um, uh, I have a question. When, when you showed the, the origami pattern, uh, is it correct that there are some uh, 
physical limitations to uh, to the point to, to how much we can use the uh, DNA as as a, as a material, as a building material. Because I guess in, in because of the origami pattern uh, or or like uh, tissue or whatever you want to call it, uh, the there is a limitation to the uh, unique. Uh, uh, you call them domains, right? So the, the unique subsequence that that have to match the the clipping, uh, the clipping side. So we cannot we can build anything, but not downscales, of course, because we have the, the the size of the molecule as a limitation. Yeah, you have to have a unique subsequence. So if it's a very very long string, your subsequence will have to be longer. So there is some some limitation there, uh, what you can address. And, and there are. Um, I guess temperature limitations and so on. So the, everything <coughs> must happen under some certain conditions, right? Yeah. Well, there are. Uh, so experiments are usually done uh, either at room temperature, which means 25 degrees, or a body temperature, which means 37 degrees, typically for medical reasons. So that are the two standard temperatures. Uh, DNA works fine until you know 50, 60 degrees, I don't know, something, something like that, um, <coughs> and works also slower, much slower, at lower temperature. So it, it's, you have to find the right kind of range. For, uh, <clears throat> for medical application, you want to work at 37 degrees, so you have to aim for that. Sometimes, for example, you want to use RNA instead of DNA, so you have to uh, adjust for that. So there are many kind of, kind of technological questions, and, but the point is that there is not yet the Intel DNA computing. There is no uh, company who's dedicated to optimizing this process yet. It's all done in university labs, uh, uh, very, very by grad students, postdocs. So there has been no heavyweight uh, optimization of the process yet. That has, has still to come. And that's one of the reasons some we have still so many difficulties in uh, engineering the systems. But it, <clears throat> no, the, those those companies will will come up with the right and. and yeah. I have a question about um, <coughs> the control you talked about. That it was very hard when you have many concurrent reactions. Then they could start interfering with each other. So um, about uh, two mechanisms that I wanted to ask you uh, how you think are reliable or not. So uh, microfluidics could be a, a way to uh, intercalate the, the reactions instead of having them all concurrently. Uh, and about methylation and the wrapping around the histones. Um, so that those are biological processes that actually interfere with DNA replication and breathing. So are they viable options or are just... So, okay, I don't know anything about methylation, I don't know, if, or, or, or using histones or anything like that. I don't know if anybody has tried that. For, uh, for the other question, which was the, um, what was it? The microfluid. The right. So, yeah, that's very, that's very interesting. And there are people who are, uh, in fact, the University of Washington, they're right now trying to uh, set up a closed-loop experimental uh, device, which has microfluidics, uh, which is done with the blue, um, blue drop, purple drop. So it's a, it's a device where you can have droplets moving in two-dimensional. It's not channeled, not really channeled. It's a, it's a surface, and you, with a, a, electrically you can move uh, uh, bubbles uh, containing DNA all over the surface in a kind of direction configuration. You can merge them and split them, so you can do this kind of experiment. And uh, then it can feed directly. You can push these bubbles to a sequencer, and the sequencer can read the, the DNA, and, and the computer can talk to a synthesizer that synthesizes DNA and pushes it back into the, into the microfluidics. So they're trying to build this kind of closed-loop uh, configuration, and then uh, you can do lots of more interesting stuff, yes. One more question. All right. Uh, thank you for an amazing talk. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, in, in that computation process that you described, um, the sequence that is being used to make the, the computations uh, in that ends up in a stable state that cannot uh, be reversed. Um, am I thinking this right, or is that kind of wasted uh, uh, matter that cannot be used for something else? So w what is the approach here to, to manage that? Because it, it seems like a, a, a big waste of, of, of uh, matter to, to just do a small computation. What's the approach? So one answer is that that is the energy source. So it's not wasted in the sense it's providing energy for the, <coughs> for the computation. But the, the issue is that eventually you run out. But the same through the laptop, eventually the battery will run out. So you, you need always to be able to replenish something. Uh, and in this case, you would have to replenish uh, material. Um, people have tried to think of a kind of a reversible gates. I don't think they, they've ever worked. 
Um, so at the moment, you think of either doing one-shot computation, like uh, sensing something in the environment, uh, and you get a result, red or green, uh, or you need to continuously add material, or you need to have in kind of a uh, continuous flow situation where the, the things are stable, but you keep adding and flowing things out, like in bioreactors. So there are many possible options depending on the application that, that you want to tackle. Yeah. Um, so... <laughs> Okay. It is energy efficient in the sense it's very, very low energy, just molecular binding. So um, it, uh, it producing the DNA, I don't know how energy efficient that is. Probably, probably not terribly intensive. It's, uh, um, so I think it is overall very energy efficient. And, and, and it, you know, biological organisms are known to work at a very low level of energy. So that, should, that shouldn't be a problem like supercomputers, okay. 